What's up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of Mock Draft Live. I'm Colleen Wolf with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. It's Bucky's big day That's right, it's on my day. the show. That's right. Your Mock 3.0. I'm ready for it. I know that we had five first round quarterbacks last week with DJ's third mock round or third draft, and now we only have three with you. Oh, maybe in the first round. Uh-oh. Don't we have to unveil it? Don't we have to? Don't we have to break it out before? Okay, we, fine. We we'll leave good. a little mystery. Let's go. You guys can check it out though on NFL.com. Be sure to do that. So let's start right at the top. We go to Carolina, and it is DJ Stroud. Yeah, CJ Stroud, when you think about it, we talk about the most natural pocket passer in this draft class, outstanding arm talent, and the prototypical dimensions. When you think about Frank Wright, Josh McCown, even Jim Caldwell, they've all had success either as big quarterbacks or dealing with big quarterbacks. To me, it just makes sense that CJ Stroud would be a perfect fit in Carolina. It's uh, Frank Reich's kind of guy, it seems like. So let's move to the second pick here, another quarterback, and it is Bryce Young to Houston. Uh, Bryce Young, really be excited about this if I'm a Texans fan because if you think about what this offense could look like, remember, they're bringing over the San Francisco 49ers system, and they did it with Brock Purdy. Now you're talking about a more talented, more dynamic playmaker in Bryce Young, if you're the Houston Texans, you absolutely love if Bryce Young is there for you at number two. Okay, so we know that two quarterbacks are going back-to-back off the top of this draft, but Bucky, tell me more about why you think the Panthers should take Stroud over Young here. Well, so if we talk about just the prototypical things that C.J. Stroud brings, that's everything that Frank Reich has always either done or worked with throughout his time. Natural pocket passer who can make all the throws. There you see him, working over the middle of the field, little escapability. Here we talk about the accuracy and rhythm. He's going to anticipate where my man is going. He's going to drop it in. And when you look at him throw, C.J. Stroud throws like a veteran who's been doing it for years. This is the part of the game that everyone wanted to see, the escapability. Can he get off platform and make plays? If the pressure's there, can he buy time? Can he create? We saw that in the playoff game against Georgia. This is the part that should excite you because now we felt like his athleticism was unleashed. When you add that to what he already does as a pocket passer, there are a lot of things to like about C.J. Stroud. I think it's really interesting, too, the different approaches that the front offices are taking between Carolina and Houston uh, as far as the pro days have gone. The Panthers have really sent the whole gang right. there. And the um, Houston Texans, they're kind of sitting back a little bit. They're <laughs> waiting for their personal visits. So, DJ, did Bucky get it right here? Well, look, I, I think those are the top two quarterbacks, and I think it still is up in the air of, of which one goes first. I would just say if it's close, I still want to take the best player, and as much as I love C.J. Stroud, to me he's number two. I think Bryce Young's just a better football player. So, you know, we talk about Fitz, and they've traditionally had and been around mm-hmm. bigger quarterbacks, but at the end of the day, you just want to get the best guy. And for me, that would be Bryce Young. And it makes a lot of sense when you talk about the performance because you can't deny what – Bryce Young is done mm-hmm. on the field. Both of these guys are talented. And I know people hate for us to agree when it comes to like, hey, both of these guys are talented. It really comes down to stylistically which one is the better fit. And so the Panthers have a few more weeks to go, but they have to determine is it CJ Stroud or Bryce Young. They haven't told you this yet, but remember when we did hashtag golf versus hashtag Vince? <laughs> oh. It's in the it's works. Coming. We Don't could bring be coming. Hashtag it's coming. Young hashtag Stroud. Uh-huh. I'm just, I mean, they're, they're getting I mean, excited the, about this. A full show about that. Okay, show. I, that's true. I don't, wanna, I don't even want to think about four it. Hour That's hour a point. Show. But all the talk is about Bryce Young's size. He's 5'10", which is rich mm-hmm. coming from yes. me um, as 5'1", and just a whisper over 200 pounds. So you have him landing with the rebuilding Texans at this point. Are you worried at all just about his durability and being able to well, kind of make it through? Well, that's always going to be a concern. But then you go and look at how he played and how he played in the SEC. This guy played at a high level. Didn't miss much time, like continue to play. You see a guy who has dealt with all of this stuff his entire life, going all the way back to modern day high school. He's always been someone who was viewed as undersized, but he's performed at a high level. And there is something about his intangibles, his ability to be a bit of a savant when it comes to playing the position that makes him very appealing and attractive. He is going to play and play very well in the National Football League. Is really a matter of can he withstand the pounding? That is the major concern that you have about Bryce Young. One of the interesting things is I went back and looked at all the times he got hit at, at Alabama and counted up 14 plays where it would have either been a penalty, a suspension, a fine. Like it would have been, you can't hit like that in the NFL. Oh, wow. The SEC, they let him go. He took some shots. He's actually going to be more protected in the NFL than he was in college. It sounds weird saying that. You think mm-hmm. about guys who are bigger, faster, stronger. 
But with the rules and the way they play in the SEC versus the way you play in the NFL, he's not going to get hit like that at the next level. And if he does go to Houston, he has a nice situation there with the running backs and Damian Pierce and Devin Singletary. So defenses can kind of focus on them a little bit as well and some good pass catchers too. I like Dalton Schultz going in there as a free agent. It's going to yes. be a nice addition. Robert Woods, uh, Nico Mechie. Collins. You'll have Mechie back. Mechie's who back. Goes from his time at Alabama. That'd and who knows? One. Maybe they'll bring in another pass catcher as well. So we'll see. But let's move on off the quarterbacks on to number three where Bucky has the Cardinals drafting Will Anderson Jr. off the edge from Alabama. Well, obviously this pick should be in play if you're the Arizona Cardinals if there's a team that wants a quarterback but if you stick and pick it has to be a pass rusher. Will Anderson to me is the best one in the class. Solid, steady, more blue collar worker off the edge. Not flashy, but, man, he's very productive, and they need someone who can be productive off the edge. Yes, help is on the way for that defensive line. How about your fourth pick? A bit of a surprise. No quarterback for the Colts? Instead, no, you're no, going edge rusher? Yeah, no quarterback for the Colts, and we're saying that maybe they're able to find their answer outside of the draft. And so let's just say, like, there's a quarterback in Baltimore that may be disgruntled. Ooh. Maybe they make a move. But if they find a way to pick, Tyree Wilson would make sense when you think about – how they want to play defense, keep everything in front. Gus Bradley does a great job of bend but don't break. Tyree Wilson can pressure the quarterback. We're going to come back to this whole conversation. <laughs> um, but first, let's keep it going here. Seattle, they're up next at five, and they go Jalen Carter. So Jalen Carter sitting there at five. When you think about the Seattle Seahawks and what they've been able to do, when they play great defense, they play with a bunch of super athletes with great instincts. He has all those things. And so if you can get okay with the character and that stuff, man, Putting him in the Pacific Northwest with that rebuilding defense, Bobby Wagner and company coming back, this should help the Seattle Seahawks Ooh. really make a run at the title coming out of the NFC. The NFC West quarterbacks hate to see it. They oh. hate it. They hate this. <laughs> the, let's head to Detroit where the Lions, they continue to build their defense. You're sending corner Devin Witherspoon to play for Dan Campbell. Can't have enough cover corners. And Aaron Glenn knows this, having been a first-round pick years ago. He now has an opportunity to get the guy who has the best toolbox that we've seen. Devin Winterspoon has everything that you look for at the position, turns, transitions, tackling ability, instincts, ball skills. He's terrific as a prospect. And both you and DJ are aligned on this pick in both of your latest mocks, so I like that. Good synergy. And at seven, another DB off the board here. Cornerback Christian Gonzalez goes to Vegas. So uh, the Las Vegas Raiders know that they have to cover the dynamite offenses in the AFC West, and so you have to have a corner who can do a few different things. Gonzalez has the ball skills, he has the toughness. More importantly, he just has a feel that you want to see in your corners. Big time playmaker on the edge. Pair him up with Nate Hobbs, and uh, that'll really help out that defense. So let's step back here, see how this thing is shaping up. Bucky has Stroud and Young going 1 2 right there off the top, then a run on defensive players, ending with Lucas Van Ness to the Falcons at 8. But what really sings here, the Colts and I guess the Raiders too, both skipping. A quarterback. I do want to focus on the Colts first because I think that's the most interesting. Um, you had Tyree Wilson going there. Obviously, Matt Ryan, mm -hmm. Sam Ellinger didn't really get it done. You mentioned maybe there's a quarterback in Baltimore they can figure it out. I don't know. You gonna mention uh, it? Maybe, like, maybe, Jim Irsay maybe. really doesn't like, like fully guaranteed contracts, though, so that it, could be a little bit of a holdup. That could be a little bit of a holdup. But now here's what you're saying: If you're the Indianapolis Colts and you're used to quarterback. Quarterback play being a certain way based on your time with Peyton Manning and then even with Andrew Luck. I'm looking at Anthony Richardson. I'm looking at Will Levis. Those guys don't appear to me to be sure things. And so if you're Jim Ursay, are you willing to roll the dice again on an unproven quarterback? Or do you try and go and stay the course and say, let's let this organically happen for us at the quarterback? Sometimes you're at the top of the board and there's a quarterback that's there like Andrew Luck. Other times there's not. There's not an Andrew Luck where they will be picking everything. Mm -hmm. The hard thing is when you look at their roster, it's hard to envision them being all the way back up here again. And it's almost like if you wait for that perfect prospect to come along, you're never going to get one. And they've been on this veteran carousel. It feels like, yes, there's tremendous risk when you look at, at, at Richardson and Levis, but the payoff could be big on either side of it. And at some point in time, you, you got to do it. You, you got to just take a shot, rip the Band-Aid off, stop going with this veteran route, and there's nothing guaranteed on Lamar Jackson front. Like, if you if you can guarantee me that they can do that, I'm in. That's my number that one option. That makes sense, I'm right. I'm doing that. But if they're not fully committed to that, going into next year with, with Gardner Menchu or whoever. A lot of dice rolling. The veteran a, lot, a lot of dice rolling here. I mean, we can eat raw bananas and put mayonnaise in our coffee and do all that other stuff with Will Levis, or we can stick to the course. This, to me, is the fascinating part of the draft. We talk about those first two guys going. 
Picks three and four, seeing if a quarterback comes off the board in those things, that's going to be the fascinating watch on draft night. And when Seattle ends up trading – or not not Seattle, sorry. When Tennessee ends up going from 11 up to three, Ooh. then we're going to have – we could end up with four quarterbacks in a row. I'm ready. If that takes place. Even though we're admitting that, hey, it's a little roll of the dice uh-huh. with these last two. So okay, we'll then see. what about the Raiders? Because you have them also – I know they have Jimmy G. Well, um, we have the, the, I know he's being paid well, as a DJ, starter for the next two seasons. DJ talks about – the face test when it comes to the quarterbacks. There's not a more handsome quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo. And so you think about the success that he had in San Francisco when he was available. Josh McDaniels gets to go back and get a quarterback that he knows, the familiarity between the two of them, not only from the system and understanding how they think and how they work together, but just the culture and the environment that they're trying to create with the Las Vegas Raiders. It makes sense. And because you have him in place, now you don't have to rush it or force it when it comes to the quarterback. Take the best player available and help your team inch closer to the defending world champions. Yeah, and the challenge here is, you know, gosh, you could say Jimmy Garoppolo is not going to be your long-term guy. If you really, really like one of these guys, you should go ahead and take him here at seven. But it's not like this is the only hole on this roster. And, and Bucky's looking in the secondary, and I think Barkley just had a birthday maybe this <laughs> They're terrible. Their secondary is <laughs> awful. <laughs> so to be able to get somebody to come in there and plug some holes there would really help. Okay. All right. That's fair. Hey, you guys, let Bucky know what you guys oh, think will. about this draft. Oh, I think I showed up my, com- I think I showed up my mentions in my comments. Oh, oh, I think oh I really? Open it up. All right, just kidding. Maybe he'll open it up just for you. But we have more coming up. Don't go anywhere. We're talking offensive line. Who are the best big men, the baddest in the class, and where are they headed? Someone text Baldy because he's going to love this next segment. Oh, you know he is. It's hard to believe, but the draft is just under a month away. You can find out where the future stars of the league will land. It all kicks off Thursday, April 27th in primetime from Kansas City. Watch it all on NFL Network and NFL Plus presented by Verizon. So let's get back to Bucky's latest mock where the Bears love up on that offensive line and get some protection for Justin Fields. That's right. Now that we've established that Justin Fields is the franchise quarterback for the Bears, you want to give him everything that he needs. We've seen them upgrade the perimeter weapons, but now you get the best offensive tackle to put in front of him. He's going to be protected not only as a runner, but now as a thrower. Plus, he can get on his BMX bike and be at the facility in five minutes. <laughs> oh, shit. Northwestern to Chicago. <laughs> Skipping down to the Titans at 11. Another tackle off the board. It's Paris Johnson Jr. to Tennessee. Oh, dancing bear. Mike Vrabel wants to get back to mauling and mashing people at the point of attack. This is a guy that moves bodies. You see him there climbing to the next level. You put this big man in front of the king, Derrick Henry. Now the Tennessee Titans can get back to playing the bully ball style that they prefer. A dancing bear named Paris, which I just love it. I love this fit. I love it for Mike Rabel. At 13, offensive linemen just keep flying off the board. Osiris Torrance gone to the Jets. That's a new name, too. Well, look, if you're going to have Aaron Rodgers there, you don't want him to get hit because then he's going to complain and all that stuff. So make sure he's upright, protected. You also have the running game with Brees Hall coming back. Osiris Torrance being able to dominate in the trenches is a recipe for success for the New York Jets. A priority is keeping Aaron Rodgers happy. That's right, when I'm happy. This pick does it. At 14, Bucky, the Pats grab the protection for Mac Jones. New England scoops up Georgia tackle Broderick Jones. Yeah, Broderick Jones. You think about the connection. Uh, they've had plenty of Bulldogs come through there. This is a guy that is a bully on the block. So we have Bill O'Brien coming back to fix the offense. And before you really can fix the offense, you got to make sure the offensive line is intact. I can see this going down for the Patriots. Okay, so they double their Jones in New England. <laughs> so a lot of big men coming off the board in picks 9 through 14. Peter Skoronsky stays in the city of Chicago uh, to block for Justin Fields. Then Bucky has Houston grabbing Jackson Smith and Jigba to pair with Bryce Young. But really the story of this entire bunch is that four of the six picks are on the offensive line. So that brings us to our cluster buster. Here we Let's go. dive into this class of alignment a little bit more, break it all down. So, Bucky, best pass protector of this entire class. Look, this is really tough, but I'm going to go with Paris Johnson. And I talked about Paris Johnson as a mauler brawler at the point of attack. But as a dancing bear, he's so nimble and light with long arms. He can get his hands into the chest of those pass rushers and keep them at bay. When you think about the physical dimensions that he brings with the athleticism and that stuff, he is going to be an outstanding pass protector at the next level. Really long. I mean, talking 36 and change with, with how long his arms are. So extremely long. He's got really quick feet. 
Power has been a little bit of an issue at times where you'll see guys get into his pads, but with that length, once he gets his hands on you, it's over. Okay, DJ, let's go run blocking. Who's the best in this class? Well, I'm going to go with Skaronsky, uh from Northwestern. And, and look, you can see that on the front side of run plays where he's got power to move you at the point of attack. You can see it on the back side where he can wash you down the line of scrimmage. And to me, the best aspect is once he gets up to that second level. Takes really good angles. He's always under control. And once he latches on, you know, it, it's over. He doesn't have that ideal length that you want to tackle. Some people think he'll end up sliding inside to guard. Uh, I, I just know one thing. He gets his guy blocked, and he is dominant in the run game. DJ talks about his stickiness. Mm -hmm. He just plashes onto his guy, creates lanes and scenes for the runners. Exactly what you want in the run game. Okay, so finally, last question, Bucky, most versatile offensive lineman. This league is all about the more you can do, your availability is your best ability. So who is it for the lineman? Uh, Cody Mock, when he puts his teeth in and has his mouthpiece in, <laughs> mm -hmm. he, he's able to do a bunch of different things. This guy can play anywhere on that front line. You're talking about a guy that was a walk-on tight end who has earned his keep in one of the best programs that we've seen in college football. Outstanding player. That versatility allows him to get a jersey not only each week, but allows him to really – help the team put the best five on the field because he can fit in wherever you need him. It feels like every year at the Senior Bowl down there in Alabama, we end up with one smaller school lineman, not a power five guy, not, you know, not even a group of five guy in this case, but they go down there, not only do they hold their own, they end up being dominant players. And that has transitioned really well to the next level. I think he's got a chance to plug and play. He's a legit five position guy. He can play any of the five positions up front. So I'm with you. I think he's easily the most versatile guy in this draft. I'm still a little stuck on him taking out his teeth and putting them back in. Yeah. But, oh, no. you know, like, yeah, I mean. He's like, giving up like, on I like, usually just keep my like teeth dentures. in. Yeah. Like dentures. Just pop them in, pop them out. He's embraced it. He's, a, he's <laughs> I love that. Love that for him. Need him. So I was also thinking we should really circle back to the Eagles. Oh, uh, shit. Talk about this pick. Bucky has them taking Georgia edge rusher Nolan Smith at 10. Now, Smith wasn't even in your last mock. Bucky, and now he shot time. all the way up to 10th overall. Okay, so here's what happens. When you work with DJ and we're on a podcast and we have – You're blaming this on DJ. No, 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 no. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. But what he did is he painted a picture for me because he compared him to Hassan Reddick. So then the more I think about it, the more I thought about how the Philadelphia Eagles backstop their top positions, meaning they have a player in place, but then they draft someone young right behind them so they can serve as an apprentice. And then when it's their time, they're ready to go. Nolan Smith being able to see Hassan Reddick work every day, to me it's an outstanding job of just putting it all together for the Eagles so they continue to wear you down with their rotation. So, DJ, you're like a Nolan Smith influencer? I yeah, I guess. Yes. You know, I, I love yes. it. By the cool. way, I love the fact that even the Eagles could be picking in the fourth round. Colleen's always going to show up in her Eagles colors. Always. And, Let's and just circle back to the Eagles real quick. And force them into the conversation. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. You've told us about Nolan Smith. To me, I like to see it. Okay, here we go. Let's, let's look at a little Nolan Smith tape. And what you're going to see is some of the things that you just talked about. First step, quickness. Watch him dip. Get up under this. Create disruption. And we talked about Hassan Reddick and how he's able to do it. It's not only that. It's the quickness off the ball, being able to dip and rip and get around the corner. Constant pressure. Doing it a few different ways. You set him up with the fastball going outside. You now come inside. He is a handful at the point of attack because it's the athleticism. It's the ability to turn speed into power. More importantly, it's the consistent disruption that you see. That's why this guy is a fabulous prospect. All right, DJ, how do you like the fit in Philly? Well, well it's going to have to change their names of Philly Bulldogs here. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to have N'Kobe Dean starting yeah. at linebacker, yeah. Jordan Davis at defensive tackle, <laughs> Nolan Smith's going to be rolling through there on the outside. Look, it's been the best defense in college football for a couple years. I have no problem collecting players like that. Oh, I did. You see him right there, 4-3-9 uh, as an edge rusher, Whoa. which is stupid. Jumped over 40 inches. And with Hassan Reddick, who's already making a good amount of money, you know when some of these other deals get done that he's going to want to go back to the table again. So who knows? You, you don't know who's going to be there long term, and you've got a young, athletic, cheap starter at a premier position. That's been the way the Eagles do business. Especially with how successful that defense was last year and then the losses that they incurred as well along the way, this would be a nice way to replenish the talent on that side of the ball. Bucky, let's move it here to – because in your second mock draft, uh -huh. you had Clemson star Miles Murphy going to the Lions at six, but he fell to the pack. Packers at 15. Um, why the tumble? Uh, just a little tumble. We just kind of worked it around. The Detroit uh -huh. Lions filled okay. some of their needs, and so they were able to get a cornerback. Miles Murphy, you just started thinking about, hey, the combine. Noah Smith looks really good in terms of his athleticism and burst, and so that's why it's not necessarily anything that Miles Murphy did. It's kind of like when you break up with a girl. Like, it's not 
you, it's, it's me. I'm working right. through some stuff. Never, so it's, it's, it's never, not him. It's me. I just wanted to put him <laughs> in a different spot so we can see the Packers really turn to their defense because it's going to be more pressure on the defense to keep these scores close because offensively, they'd be a little different without Aaron Rodgers. They're going to be working through some things there. Uh, yes. What do you think about the fit uh, with Joe Barry? <laughs> it's like a left turn on that thing. <laughs> oh, I'm just, that's what we do. I like the fit. I think it's a good mm-hmm. marriage uh, between uh, yes. Miles Murphy and, and this defensive scheme. They've traditionally liked power rushers working off the edge. Think about Rashawn Gary, speed to power guy. Miles Murphy, speed to power guy. I, I think it makes some sense there. And again, you can go back to it and you can look at other knees and, and other holes on the roster. Colin, we, we, we saw it in the Super Bowl last year. When you have the two best defensive lines mm-hmm. playing for a championship, it, that's how you win games. You can't have enough of these guys. Go get them. That's the new model. There you go. And that's it. It's a yeah. copycat league, so I'm sure we're going to see plenty more of that. Coming up, we have plenty more of this show. We have another quarterback off the board. Find out where Bucky has electric playmaker Anthony Richardson mocked. We're back in just a few. We're rolling right through Bucky's latest mock. It's Washington's turn, and you've picked Joey Porter Jr. to join Jack Del Rio's defense. Yeah, I think when Ron Rivera looks at Joey Porter Jr., he might see a little Josh Norman in his game. You think about playing the style of defense they want to play, where they can play quarters, they can lock up. I think it's perfect for Joey Porter Jr. He would be a nice fit for the commanders on the edge. Okay, how about another corner off the board at 17? The Steelers, they lost Cam Sutton in free agency, but you have them taking his replacement here. Yeah, Deontay Banks is a physical corner on the edge. You like the length, the athleticism, his ability to tackle in space will certainly be appealing to the Steelers. And in terms of someone with tremendous upside, when you watch him work out at the combine, you see him work out at his pro day. He has a lot of intriguing tools to build around. So let's take a look here at Bucky's picks 15 through 19. Four straight defenders, including back-to-back corners in Joey Porter Jr. and Deontay Banks. Now, the Seahawks, they're on the clock, and they have their eyes on the quarterback from Gainesville. Richardson fires one over the middle in stride. Richardson, he'll load it up and cut it loose with that big arm. Makes a tackle, and there he goes. Richardson in the end zone. Wide open for Richardson. Anthony Richardson is dangerous in the open field. And with that, the Seahawks lock down their quarterback of the future at 20, adding Anthony Richardson, who gets to learn from Geno Smith. Here we go. What a world. (laughs) What a world. And this is the perfect scenario for Anthony Richardson and the Seattle Seahawks. You're talking about a luxury pick. You have two first-round picks. You're sitting at 20. You now have an opportunity to take a super athlete with upside at quarterback. You have Geno Smith in tow, so there's not a rush to get him on the field. And so whether it's 2024 or 2025, you can take your time to put Anthony Richardson in a situation where he can be successful. The Seattle Seahawks have one of the best player development programs that we've seen in terms of getting players ready to play. This could be the nice spot for him and for them to have a quarterback of the future already in tow. Now, Richardson wasn't in your last mock draft. He wasn't in your top five. He hates quarterbacks. Positional he's not, he's not rankings. Just, just he's hates back, though. Just hates but he's, okay, he's so was the combine that eye-opening for, well, I mean, it's for him eye-opening. and everyone? It's eye-opening when you see someone with that kind of athleticism. We can talk about what it looks like as a, as a player, but the athleticism is remarkable. And so you're looking at a guy with big-time arm talent. Like, there's not a throw that he is not able to make. It's the mobility, the athleticism. You see a guy 6'4", 244 pounds. He runs 4'4", He jumps out the building. He has all of these things that has led to comparisons to Cam Newton because of his ability to create. You may want to tap into that if you're Pete Carroll and you talk about finding a way to make the best out of a player. Power running like this. Remember, Pete Carroll wants to run the ball. He wants to play defense. Well, now you have a running quarterback. He can do those things. It allows you to control the game, puts you in a different category when it talks about teams that are title contenders, potentially in the NFC. It's hype season this time of year. And players that do well at the Combine, I always watch them climb up draft boards. I wonder if teams will be overly excited about him, if he'll last to the Seahawks. And then if he does, how do you like him in Seattle? Can I go to my research department right here? I would love that. Are you phoning a friend? I am phoning a friend. Uh, So here you go, Buck. This is quarterbacks that were taken second by a team in the draft. So they had a, a pick before them. 
and they came back for the quarterback. Lamar Jackson, tremendous success in 2018. Bing. Right? Mm -hmm. But let's go through the next. You give me. Uh, we'll go through these. Just tell me how much you love these quarterbacks. Uh, Johnny Manziel, Teddy Bridgewater, Brandon Whedon, Tim Tebow, Brady Quinn, Jason Campbell, J.P. Lossman, Kyle Bowler. How's that? How's that treat you? <laughs> Uh, the only one that I would say that's, that's, that's treating me well is maybe Teddy B a little bit. But, oh, was, but look, look, it's a new year. If it's just good like enough, it, you take it you. with your first pick. You don't take it It's with a your New second. Year's resolution. New Year, new me. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're saying. If the Seattle Seahawks elect to take him with the second first round pick, Look, it could work. We talk about value. And you've been you yeah. did the dating thing earlier, so this is the equivalent of hey, if you're not doing something on Friday night. Well, first of all, I'm going to ask Jill. But if Jill can't go, then I would love to hang out with you. <laughs> that would be great. You have to have a contingency it's plan. Yeah. It's Jill. smart. It's asking, your second first round pick. It's asking, asking can I do something him? else before I pick you up? If that's all, I just, potential like, double yeah, booking. Like a double booking. Trouble. I just need to do something else before I can get to Anthony Richardson. So we're going to take the big guy. We'll come back and get him on the back end. Yeah. Scoop you up after the basketball game. It's a lack of commitment is what that is. <laughs> is Anthony Richardson the real deal? Well, if you want to catch him live in action, be sure to watch his Florida Pro Day this Thursday, 1130 a.m. Eastern, live on NFL+. Plus. So if you don't have NFL+, Plus, make sure you sign up at plus.nfl.com. And maybe he will be the match for your team. What is he going to be doing on a Friday night? You know, I don't him. know. I don't Thanks know. Thanks for letting me phone a friend, <laughs> Let's by keep the, way. the mock going, everybody. And looky, looky, Bucky's got a running there back we go. heading to Hollywood. Uh, B. John Robinson, one of the best in the biz. He is a guy that, day one, he should be in contention for being a rushing leader. You put him with the charges, it gives them a beefy back who also can step outside and catch passes. I just love putting someone dynamic like that behind Justin Herbert. Okay, so DJ, you spend a lot of time in the radio booth calling games for the Chargers. How do you like this pick? How, have you started thinking about different calls potentially <laughs> just based off of Bucky's mock draft? No, I just let money handle all that okay, stuff. Good. He's got the hard job. I've got the easy job. But he would be fun to watch on a weekly basis if you popped B. John Robinson into this offense. Now, Austin Eckler has made it be known he wants a new deal. We'll see what happens there. You know, I, I don't see a, a trade coming there. But I think this would be an unbelievable piece to compliment Austin Eckler. Also, lighten up some of his load. You could use him more in the slot, do some different things with him because he's so versatile. But B. John Robinson, to me, was Edger and James. When you look at the comparisons of players coming out, that's how highly I think of him. And, you know, I... The whole running back value is another show for another day, but this dude is worth it, I promise you. He's my third-ranked player in the entire draft. So your comp is Edge for him? Yes. And it, look, the number five, they both were number five in college. Oh, they fall prey to that a little bit, but just in terms of their running style, they can really catch the ball out of the backfield. Just complete, complete players. Who is your comp for Well, him? I won't compare him to a gold jacket guy, but I will say he reminds me a lot of Joe Mixon in terms of his versatility, in terms of being a big back that can run it and catch it out of the backfield. You think about what Joe Mixon has been able to do for the Cincinnati Bengals in terms of transforming this team into a title team, you put them behind Joe Burrow and you've seen how this offense is absolutely popped. Same thing happens with the Chargers. You put Bijan Robinson behind Justin Herbert, yeah, we could talk about them potentially ringing the bell as the mm -hmm. AFC champs. When you look at the top running backs in terms of yards and production and being able to put games away, they're all, they're all in that same size area and they're 217 plus pounds. Uh, and B. John Robinson can give you some of that thump, just like Mixon can, without sacrificing the big playability. He can do it all, so we'll have to wait to see what happens with Austin Eckler, but he would fit really well into that offense with the Chargers. So let's take a look at picks 20 to 26. Some big-time playmakers going to the Saints and the Chargers in Richardson and Robinson. The Vikings, they grab route-running specialist Zay Flowers to pair with Justin Jefferson. And, you know, a guy we didn't see in DJ's mock draft after last week, Brian Branch heading to Jacksonville to give them some flexibility in the secondary. Okay, so 26 picks in, and we still haven't seen two very big names. Will Levis and Quentin Johnson. Will they make the cut, Bucky? Got to find out. That's coming up next. is made by Addison. He's so dangerous after the catch. He's like a joystick out there. The human joystick. The Bolitnikov winner moves the six again. They're going to swing it to Addison. This is Addison. He's got the edge. So with the 27th pick, Bucky has the Bills picking Jordan Addison to catch passes from Josh Allen up in Buffalo. Yeah, you, you, 
you think about Stefan Diggs and what he's been able to do as a number one, you want to put someone opposite him that has playmaking ability, but also outstanding route running skills. When you look at Jordan Addison, Ooh. he wears people out with his ability to really utilize a bunch of tricks uh, at the top of the routes to create separation. I love trying to help Josh Allen by adding more route runners around him to make the game easier for him as a passer. I would love to see this. Now, it's been a roller coaster for Jordan Addison in each of your last couple of mock drafts. He was one of the last picks for both of you guys in mocks 1.0, rose all the way up to Houston with the 12th pick in your second mock draft. And then Bucky has him back to Buffalo at 27 this time, so a couple spots below where DJ had him last week. Um, Bucky, why has he bounced all over the place in these mocks? It's really hard to figure out where these wide receivers are going to go. There's so many guys that can play, and so many of them have specific sets, skill sets that kind of lead them to certain roles. And do you want to use a first round pick on that and if you do use that the higher you take them the more you're thinking that they can be a number one and so just trying to find the right spot for him to do what he does really well he's an outstanding route runner not quite convinced that he's a number one receiver mm. but he certainly can make contributions if you put him in the right role okay so let's say that role is in buffalo dj how do you see that working out i really like it and and to me when you look at why he may be sliding a little bit from where we each had him 12 overall to the texans he was 173 pounds at the combine so you're hoping he was going to be a little bit bigger he's a little bit light i think that's a little bit of a concern for some teams but as an overall player i love the route polish i love the fact that i think he can play outside i think he could go inside as well uh, I love the fit in Buffalo. You're in, look, in the AFC with the Kansas City Chiefs there, we talked about on the podcast the other day, just give up. You're not stopping them. So you might as well just load up with as many offensive playmakers as you can because you're going to need to score 30, 35 points to beat them. I did find it interesting that he weighed in so light and then ran a, a 4-4-9. Four, four, yeah, I thought he might be a little bit faster little bit, than that as well. But we're splitting hairs. So speaking of pass catchers, though, here, how about a new one for Joe Burrow, shall we? At 28 here, Bucky is the Bengals replacing Hayden Hurst with Utah's Dalton Kincaid. You may not be paying attention but there's a theme in the FC score score score, score. score because you're trying to keep up with the Kansas City Chiefs uh, Don Kentate just thinking about putting him with T Higgins Tyler Boyd Jamar Chase opening up the field and really forcing the defense to pick your poison to me it makes a lot of sense for the Cincinnati Bengals to add a dynamic pass catcher to the middle of the field Ooh, yeah I don't like it I don't like what? it because I love it uh, oh. this is my favorite pick of this mock draft <laughs> That's a home run for Joe Burrow. He'll go off in that offense. I can't imagine. That is the scariest offense if something like this happens. How about another tight end off the board? Bucky, the Saints, they go Michael Mayer out of Notre Dame. You know, similar but different in terms of you want to control the middle of the field for Derek Carr. This is not quite Darren Waller, but what you're talking about is a big post-up option down in the red zone, someone that can create and get open, but also upgrades your running game. Complete, probably the most complete tight end that we have because he's a natural wide receiver, meaning he is going to be very comfortable playing alongside the offensive tackle, being able to do things in the running game and also in the passing game. You change up the lyrics of his cousin John Mayer's music. The middle of the field is his <laughs> wonderland. You know, that's, that's what it is. I feel something happening. I feel like I'm starting to love the Saints a little bit. It's, mm. it's starting to gain momentum. So just like an FYI for everybody out there. So just to recap and finish up round one here, a run on pass catchers with former Trojan George and Addison joining Josh Allen up in Buffalo. Then the Bengals and the Saints, they grab the top two tight ends in the draft in Kincaid and Mayer. And then the Chiefs, they wrap up things with the edge rusher out of Northwestern who lit it up at the Combine. So, Bucky, I mean, look, along with everyone else on uh, Twitter, I know, everyone. Standing ovation. Yes. That's what we're getting. Thank v you. Very good job. But couldn't help but notice that Kentucky quarterback Will Levis um, oh, was still kind of like waiting for him. Oh, he wasn't. Where is he? He wasn't. He wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't um, in there. You had him at seven in your last mock. So why the drop? So the drop will be. We had a couple quarterback situations that were resolved in free agency. We had the combine, and we've had the pro day with Will Loveson. Still waiting to see if he's truly a first-round talent. Outstanding athleticism, has great skills, but can he process it and put it all together? He's still a work in progress. And because of that, if you're hedging your bet as a team, maybe you wait in the second round to take a player like that because it's more of a project than a polished performer. If you rewind, you'll hear Bucky take a really – deep breath and you'll see him lean forward in his chair. Really, <laughs> what does this mean? To really dive into this explanation here. 
Uh, look, it, it, there's <laughs> the challenge is whether or not you'd feel comfortable taking him in the first round versus whether one of these teams is going to end up taking him mm -hmm. in the first round. And I think because it's such a benefit to have these quarterbacks on a rookie contract, and I think that fifth year for first round guys is a big thing. If you're going to take him in the second round, you're probably better off taking him in the first round just to get the extra year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll see how this all shakes up. There's still a month to go here before we get to the draft. But maybe, mock maybe. drafts are about scenarios, and Buck gave us an interesting scenario. Yeah. All right. Maybe, so maybe, maybe I'm going to pull a, a Bucky here. Deep breath. Yes, he did. He did. Oh, I'm here. telling you, rewind that thing. Where would you like to see Will Levis in the second <laughs> round? <laughs> I like that. I mean, I like that. Where would you like nice. to see him go? I want to see him go with an established quarterback okay. because I feel like he needs some time. So maybe the Minnesota Vikings so Kevin O'Connell can work with him. Oh. Let him go behind Kirk Cousins, figure out what he can do with him, have a year to see that on the practice field, and then in a year or so you give him an opportunity to maybe to start in quarterback. That's an interesting one. I, I have not connected them, but I know Minnesota's done a ton of homework on this quarterback class, mm -hmm. so I would not rule them out. I think I've flirted with the idea of Hennon Hooker uh, being a pick there mm -hmm. for them where they're slotted there in the first round. But, you know, whether it's Levis, whether it's Hennon Hooker, or maybe they get, you know, kind of jumpy and want to go up and get somebody, I think the Minnesota Vikings are a real threat to take a quarterback. That's a good destination on the spot, too. So, <laughs> Very much so. Thank all right. You. So, Very Will Levis so. No actually script. sat down with Stacey Dales and uh, David Carr at Kentucky's Pro Day last week to talk about some of the criticism he's unfortunately faced. Is it nuts to you, Will, that people are like, this guy's too big to come into the NFL and play quarterback? Like, if you were if you were 10 pounds lighter, they'd be saying, you just got to put on 10 pounds to play in the NFL. <laughs> what, what is your reaction to that? Who cares? I mean, <laughs> I think it's a compliment. You know, I take yeah. it as a compliment. And the fact that I don't look like most quarterbacks, I think, is a good thing. Let sure. me ask you, Will, like schematically, you've talked to all these teams. Have you let your brain wander to like, okay, if I go here, this is what they'll ask me to do. If I go here, like, have you guys talked about that? Have you thought about that scheme fit wise or no. where you'd like to play? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I think that's something kind of that I'll think a lot more about getting as we get closer. Sure. I think I think in the, in the few weeks leading up to the draft and as I'm going on my top 30 visits. Yeah. Okay, so Will Levis may have missed the cut for Bucky's mock draft, but the Colleen Wolf mock 1.0. Oh, you better believe that his name is getting called night one of the draft. I'll keep you posted on when that mock yes, is. Yes, oh, look out. Definitely TBD. Um, but find out who's going where. It all kicks off Thursday, April 27th in primetime from Kansas City. Catch all the action on NFL Network and NFL Plus. All right, it's time to play a little stock up, stock down, Buck. We've got three players uh, that we're going to talk about here that are either climbing or, or falling as we go through the draft process, not just in mock drafts, but in our rankings, your top five and my top 50. Let's start, first of all, here with Tajay Spears, a running back out of Tulane. You're going to go up. Up, 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 up. One of my favorite players to watch, and I know how you like to watch tape with, like, R&B playing. Yes, I do. When I look at him, this guy brings me back to a little jagged edge. Ooh. I mean, look. Fell right out of heaven. I was gonna like, say, walked right out of heaven. I love what he is able to do. His ability to put his foot in the ground, change gears, get to the next level. I absolutely love it. Electric playmaker who has a penchant for putting the ball in the paint. He is a fantastic prospect. We talk about day two players that can make it happen. Tajay Spears is one. Yeah, stop, start, quickness. That is his game. He's got unbelievable stop, start, quickness. You only, not only see it as a runner, you see it out of the backfield. We saw it at the Senior Bowl. It was probably the most impressive route we saw down there the entire week. Little angle route, cross your face. Yes. Went underneath. It was like going in a tunnel. Went underneath <laughs> the defender and got away from him. All right, Jalen Hyatt up next here. I'm going to go, let's go down a little bit here. And not to take anything from away, away from him. I feel like I know what he is. I appreciate what he does. He is a vertical guy. Now, they did it a lot from the slot, a lot of those slot verticals, and he ran away from everybody. So, if I'm saying there's value and I know what he is and he has a role, why is the stock down? This is just traditionally where these speed receivers go, Buck. I don't think he's a full route tree guy at this point in time. I think there's some route polish that needs to take place. The second round has kind of been the sweet spot for guys with his skill set. Well, that's the difference between a number one receiver and a complimentary receiver, which is where Jalen Hyatt would project. Big time playmaker, vertical stretch player, but in the second round is typically where those guys go. Not many that do it better than he does, but you're talking about a day two possibility. No doubt. I was actually talking to a scouting buddy who was at their game against Alabama and said, look, that might be one trick. 
But, but it's, a nice it's a nice it's trick. It's a nice trick. To trick. Have. It was big time. All right, Quentin Johnson, let's stay on the receiver trend here at TCU. Look, Quentin Johnson, I like him a lot, but it's similar to Jalen Hyatt. Not the one trick pony per se, but I wonder if he's ever going to evolve to being a number one receiver. Big, fast, physical, outstanding attributes, but inconsistent with the hands, and I worry about his ability to run the entire route tree. When you look at some of the other guys in this draft class, a little more complete, a little more polished, which is why he's kind of fallen for me in my rankings. Yeah, again, good football players. They're going to find the right fit, the right spot. They're going to have a role. They're going to make plays. But when we've done this in the past at the receiver position, Buck, when we've looked at it, it's those route runners, it's those polished technicians, those craftsmen that have made that immediate impact. No, that's what it is. It's about your ability to consistently get open. If you're going to be a number one, you have to have all the tools in the toolbox. Not quite what Quentin Johnson shows, even though he's a really good prospect. Well, there you have it. A little stock up, stock down, Colleen. Thank you, guys. Okay, so which fan base is going to be the happiest at the end of night one of the NFL draft? Well, coming up next, we'll dive into the four teams that have multiple first-round picks and figure out who it's going to be. Back here on Mock Draft Live, four lucky teams have multiple picks in this year's first round. Here's a look at who Bucky mocked to them. The Texans start their rebuild with Young and Smith and Jigba. Pete Carroll lands Jalen Carter and his quarterback of the future, Anthony Richardson. Then the Lions go defense heavy, as do the Eagles. So looking at those four teams, who walks away from night one the absolute happiest, Bucky? Houston Texans, they get a franchise quarterback in Bryce Young, who is a savant who can keep everything on the rails when it comes to running the train. And then you get a playmaking wide receiver in Jackson Smith and Jigba. You put these two guys together, you now have an opportunity to really grow together as a team. This perimeter passing game and some of the weapons that they have in place, it should allow them to score points and make them a more competitive team going forward. And Colleen's going to be mad at me because I'm not saying the Eagles either. I love those okay. picks for the Eagles, but I, I'm actually going to go with the Detroit Lions because I thought they got two really good football players. Two guys that aren't necessarily the, the size that you would like there, but when you look at Witherspoon, what he does in coverage, the physicality, the toughness, the playmaking skills, I love that. And then Kalijah Kansi on the defensive side of the ball. Get up the field, make plays, be a disruptor. That's him. DJ, I'll allow it because I've adopted the Lions as oh, they're your, second oh, they're your team. favorite they're your team, second team in the NFC. Yeah, so when you've been doing this for so long, you start to have to have different favorite teams. So, you know, the they're Eagles the are my first circle. baby, oh. obviously. Um, and, yes, they're on the uh, they're, they're in on the deck. on deck circle. So. <laughs> um, but, guys, next week we got Lance Zerline oh, coming through. So get excited for his mock draft 3.0. We're going to dig into it. But in the meantime, you'll have Bucky's to look over. And, um, you know, send them your comments At somehow, Bucky some Brooks. way. You can find them. Yeah. You can. <laughs> we'll see you next time.